good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for letting me go first because of the flight that I'm catching. So I'm going to talk about immunosuppression in contour diseases. It ain't a scale. So I'd like to thank Somshila because she gave all these titles or rhyming uh, headings, so it was kind of nice. Uh, so when you look at immunosuppression, uh, we think of the corticosteroids, which is some of the most common drugs that we use. And uh, the others would be anti-metabolites, the T-cell inhibitors, alkylating agents, and biological agents. And as ophthalmologists, we're usually not very well versed with all of these drugs. So there's a little apprehension with wanting to start them, particularly when you come across certain kind of conditions where um, these are needed. So I'm just going to run through, uh, you know, what are the prerequisites that we have to think of. Uh, I think first of all, it's very important to rule out an active infection like tuberculosis or fungus before we start these medications and uh, get some basic blood investigations done. Um, then we need to follow up these patients, so we need to do a routine uh, investigations when we follow them up. It's very important to know that the patient is not pregnant at the time of receiving the drugs and some of the safe drugs that can be used are drugs like infliximab and adalimumab. It's also important to ensure that the patients don't receive any live vaccines while they're on therapy and watch out for any illnesses, infection or fever in the course of follow-up. So um, when we look at corticosteroids, because we usually start therapy with corticosteroids because other immunological agents, they take some time to kick in. So we usually start them in the dose of about one milligram per kilogram body weight, and that is tapered weekly to a level of about five to 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight. But then if we need to continue these drugs for a longer period of time, keeping in mind the long list of side effects, which you can see on the right hand of the slide, uh, it makes more sense if we add the other agents and uh, table the systemic corticosteroids and then continue on those. Uh, sometimes for certain conditions, and I come to those in the next couple of slides, we tend to give uh, pulse doses of ibuprofen, either 500 uh, grams or one gram for one day, uh, and there are certain instances where we, we may just give it for a day, and there are instances where we give it uh, for three days and then switch to oral uh, therapy. So the list of complications or side effects associated with systemic steroids is very long, and we're all very familiar with this, and that is part of the reason why uh, you know uh, we are very hesitant to start these drugs. But for certain conditions, and I'll talk about those in a bit, uh, it's important. Uh, the other drugs that we use are the anti-metabolites, which inhibit nucleic acid synthesis, and they affect cell proliferation. So some of these drugs are, the short forms are AZT for acetalprid, uh, methotrexate, for, uh, which is NTX, and MMF, which is mycophenolate morphitin. So all these drugs help us in bringing down the inflammation, and they act uh, you know, either on the purine analogs like azathioprine, the dose being one to three milligrams per kilogram per day, um, but they help us in controlling the inflammation. Now, what we need to be aware of, particularly when we when we are treating you know, treating patients with azathioprine, is that they do tend to have GI intolerance, uh, bone marrow suppression, and hepatotoxicity. So it's important to investigate them at regular intervals. Initially, we prefer weekly, and then after that, it's monthly investigations on a regular basis. And if you have serial investigations, so you should actually keep a track of it. Because you look at the white blood count and you notice, okay, they started with 11,000, but then over the course of time, if that white blood count is dropping and it comes down to 4,000, even though it's within the normal range, but it has dropped, and that's what we have to watch out for, that they should not develop uh, bone marrow suppression and go into uh, other complications because of that. Um, so with methotrexate, we have to give it on Sundays. We usually start with 7.5, increase it. Uh, usually we tend to give about 12.5 milligrams per week. can move up to 20. But suppose a patient requires more than 20 milligrams for, com for uh, controlling of the inflammation, we should switch to subcutaneous because the viability of the drug when given orally is much less, doesn't get absorbed well. So we should keep that in mind when dealing with methotrexate. Um, the side effects I've listed on the side here. Now, the anchorating agents are a little more toxic, specifically cyclophosphamide, mainly because it tends to cause hemorrhagic cystitis, so it's important for the patients to be very well hydrated. Uh, we do give patients oral drugs, but then what is found is that the, uh, the IV drug, if you give it in pulse doses, um, is less toxic and that's what is beneficial to patients. You can give them three weekly or monthly doses of uh, pulse dose of cyclophosphamide when there's significant amount of inflammation and it can help in reducing the inflammation in these patients. But we have to pay attention to uh, opportunistic infections, the bone marrow suppression, which is again because of cumulative dose of the oral drug. So what happens is over time, the, the, the drug builds up in the body, it's metabolized in the liver, it causes bone marrow suppression, and uh, this actually is reversible. So this can be reversed if, uh, if we stop the drug in time and we pick it up. 
So the other drug that we could give is chlorambucil. And in the high dose, it can be given around 2 milligrams per day. In the low dose, if you have to give it for a longer period of time, it's about 0.1 to 0.2. Um, the advantage that chlorambucil has over uh, cyclophosphamide is the fact that it doesn't have the bladder problems. So otherwise, the side effects are very similar. There are several other biologic agents that we use, which are the DNF alpha inhibitors, and all these drugs are listed out here. Uh, we usually, you know, uh, prescribe these medications uh, in conjunction with the rheumatologist. But the problem with these drugs is that there's a risk of infusion reactions and infection, and it's very important to keep a uh, watch for this. So the symptoms that patients complain of when they come in follow up have to be inquired into whether they have any problem, running any fever, or urinary tract infection, respiratory tract infection, because they're prone for these. Moving on now. So this young lady, she was 43 years old when she presented to us, uh, came to us with a history of dryness. She was just 43, bear that in mind. And when we stayed, she had a very bad ocular surface. When we retracted the lids, this is what we found. So there's a subclinical uh, shortening of the phonics. There's some fibrosis that you can appreciate here. There's very subtle subclinical fibrosis in this area here. And so we diagnosed her as OCP. We got a biopsy done, but then our sample had to be sent to Hyderabad because I was in Bysac at the time. And uh, that did not show any staining uh, on immunofluorescence. But uh, that did not deter us from starting immunosuppression. So we referred her to the rheumatologist. He put her on azathioprine. This is time up for one. This is like five minutes or ten minutes. Ten. Hello. Ten. Yes. <laughs> okay. Seven or ten? Of course, ten. 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 So we were uh, thinking that she had, though the eye was not significantly inflamed, but then uh, she was very, very symptomatic and we felt that the immunosuppression was inadequate. We did tarsorafis, we put uh, uh, a of serum, put a bandage contact lens, and sent her back to the rheumatologist for increasing her immunosuppression. So he started with initially with rituximab, that didn't help. He put her on um, etanocept, that didn't help. Finally, she was put on pulse doses of cyclophosphamide. And that finally helped to bring down the uh, inflammation and um, the vision when she presented was 2040 each eye. Here it was around 2060 and CF1 meter. And she's 43 years old, not able to manage her day to day activities in the house. She developed uh, cataract because of corticosteroid. But finally, we did cataract surgery. She's been on maintenance dose of immunosuppression ever since, not had, a, not had a flare up. With closed lenses, she's now 2030 in each eye. So we were able to salvage this only because of our timely intervention with the immunosuppression. We have patients who present to us like this, 60 year old lady, post cataract surgery, presented us with inability to open her eyes, watering and burning sensation. Looking at straight case didn't seem so bad, but when she looked down, you notice that she has got necrotizing scleritis with inflammation, with PUK. So she complained of joint pains. When we investigated, her rheumatoid factor was 910, but hemoglobin was 6. So with a hemoglobin of 6, the rheumatologist was not willing to start on immunosuppression. We had to tackle it with PredMet. Fortunately, she did okay, and the inflammation was under control, and her vision improved. So sometimes, if the investigations that we do, they don't allow us to, you know, start the immunosuppression that we want, and we were able to manage her just on PredMed. We started with eight milligrams, then gradually taped it off, and she's doing better. So we may wonder whether she would need a scleral patch graft, but fortunately, um, it wasn't the case. Uh, we shouldn't get scared when we see this kind of inflammation because once the the immunosuppression kicks in. The inflammation comes down and they don't actually perforate. They actually heal over, they epithelialize, and then you don't have to do anything. So this remained quiescent for many years. Uh, this lady, she was 35 when she presented to us, gave us with a significant inflammation, diagnosed case of SLE, and uh, she was already on, um, uh, if I remember correctly, she had received two doses of rituximab and that was it. But then she came with a flare-up of scleritis along with a keratitis. There wasn't an ulceration, but it was just posterior stromal cell infiltrate. And one of the fellows thought that this was an infection, so they scraped. But that was not necessary because there was no epithelial breakdown. We started on topical steroids, got her back onto immunosuppression, put her on cyclophosphamide. Now she received pulse doses every three weeks. And over a couple of days, along with the topical steroids and this increased therapy, we noticed that she quieted down. And after that, she's been kept on a higher dose of immunosuppression. They stepped up her doses, uh, put her, switched her back onto uh, methotrexate, and now she's you know kind of on a 10 milligram dose and she's doing good. The other condition that we come across very frequently is Muran's ulcer, where we have we follow a stepladder pattern. 
and it's mostly the bilateral cases with more than two quarters of involvement that require some form of systemic immunosuppression. Otherwise, we could get away with just topical steroids, conjunctival resection, and UBCL. So this is one of those cases which just requires topical steroids and um, and uh, conjunctival resection UBCL. Uh, the bilateral cases where they have uh, you know more than two quarters of involvement with thinning, we would start with oral steroids. But then if you have patients like this where there's a significant amount of thinning and melting, more than two quadrants in normal, maybe with a perforation that's going to have impending or already happened, we would hit them with IV methylprednisolone, put them on immunosuppression like oral steroids. And then if it's a recurrent case, then we switch immunosuppression and keep them on a longer dose of either methotrexate or acetylprene. One-eyed patients particularly, those are the tough ones to manage. And when they've already had a melt in one eye and they're monocular, uh, they require, you know, IV methylprednisolone, maybe even IV cyclophosphamide to bring them under control. The other condition which we don't explore too frequently is the high-risk grafts, and uh, these would be the grafts that are very prone to rejection. Multiple grafts that have been done, depasteurization, multiple quadrants, very large grafts which are limbus to limbus and require a repeat surgery. Um, or if you've done a surgery in a hot eye, then um, and multiple grafts thereafter, they've had one in melts falling HSV, then probably they might require systemic immunosuppression. So this was one patient that already had two grafts prior, and she was uh, one eye. So we wanted to ensure that there was scarring, so she was not amenable to a DSEP. And uh, with microfinil and morphotil, we maintained her graft for over three years. Then she got careless and had problems. The other would be these kind of grafts where you have allograft rejection, where they require a pulse dose of methylprednisolone to maintain them. So this is just one dose, 500 milligrams, increase the dose of topical steroids, and this stromal rejection can be reversed and you can do well. So it's important to have a knowledge of the types of drugs uh, available, their dosage and their side effects. They're very effective in all the immunological diseases that we come across, but it's important to have a regular follow-up, investigate them at each time, and work in consultation with the rheumatologist or psychotypo so that you can achieve you know, a stabilization of their ocular conditions. Thank you very much. So, yeah, it was a wonderful uh, talk by Dr. Merl, as we all know she has to leave. So, uh, yes, by uh, Purvasha. So, she says that leaving the concepts there, so the concepts are what you look great. Thank you. Uh, good evening to one and all. Uh, my talk is on newer drug delivery in uh, microbial keratitis. <coughs> microbial keratitis is a site threatening condition and the medical cure is uh, mostly desired by the corneal surgeons uh, because surgical intervention has got so many several uh, shortcomings uh, like reinfection, secondary glaucomas, right, uh, rejections, etc. And but for the medical treatment, there are so many barriers for drug bioavailability. So the barriers in drug ocular drug absorption might be at the pre-corneal level or at the corneal level. Pre-corneal level, the drug get, can get uh, diluted in the tears and uh, the drainage of the tears through the nasal ecumenal duct into the systemic absorption. And corneal level, it is a rate limiting barrier wherein the outer epithelium is lipophilic, a middle one is uh, hydrophilic and the inner endothelium is lipophilic again. So the drug has to be both lipo, uh, li lipid soluble and also water soluble. And apart from corneal absorption, there is scleral and conjunctival absorption and hence the drug bioavailability reduces. So the existing conventional drug delivery system has a less bioavailability, protein drug binding, less intimate contact and patient in compliance. Hence the need for a novel drug delivery which has a sustained release, deeper penetrations and improved absorption. So the various drug, newer drug delivery system uh, like vesicular systems uh, which are uh, again classified as liposomes, neosomes, discomes, pharmacosomes, bioavailability enhancers like viscosity adjusters, penetration enhancers, prodrugs, particulate, uh, particulate uh, system like microparticles and nanoparticles and advanced systems and controlled release systems. So nanotechnology is uh, a based ocular vesicular drug delivery system has got many types nanomissiles, liposomes, dendrimers, nanospheres and nanocapsules. 
So here the drug uh, molecules are uh, concentrated in the center core and they are surrounded by the uh, outer layer. So the platforms may be polyesters, poly polysaccharides, polyamines and lipids or metals. So liposomes are nanocarriers which have a lipid bilayer. They separate the uh, drug molecule which is in the center core from that of the exterior. So these liposomes conjugated uh, drugs are, uh, are, are uh, being uh, uh, manufactured only for, uh, for uh, drugs which have a, a poor corneal penetration and having a short residence time. These liposomes can be uh, coated with chitosin, ceramides or other uh, coenzyme Q10s and uh, mucoadhesives for increasing the residence time. So fluconazole is such an example in which it is conjugated with the liposomes for uh, prolonging the residence time in the ocular surface. Neosomes are very similar to that of the liposomes. Instead of a lipid bilayer, they have a non-ionic surface active agents. So gatifloxacin, lomifloxacin, natamycin, uh, these drugs are being conjugated with neosomes, like uh, nanocarriers for uh, incre increased absorption and prolonging the residence time. All these uh, drug trials are being done only in the animal studies. So natamycin uh, has uh, had a uh, uh, two-fold increase in the antifungal activity against fusarium when conjugated with the cell penetrating peptides. So the control release uh, uh, drug delivery, uh, they can be, they, they can, there are two types, uh, which the agents which will improve the corneal permeability and the agents which uh, increase the corneal retention time. Uh, the uh, means by which corneal permeability can be increased is by disruption of the epithelial tight junctions by using surfactants, calcium chelating agents, permeation enhancers, iron pairing, enzymatic transformation using by prodrugs, electrical current iontophoresis and the retention time is prolonged with, by using excipients like viscosity increasing polymers, mucoadhesive polymers, cyclodextrins, colloidal delivery nanosystems and solid formulations like ocular inserts and contact lenses. The viscosity enhancers uh, are methyl cellulose, polyvinyl alcohols, polyacrylic acids, sodium carboxymethyl cellulose, carbomers. They increase the viscosity of the drug and leads to decrease in the drainage and enhance the contact time. Penetration enhancers are BAK, polyethylene glycol, ethers, EDTA and chelating agents and bile salts. Draw drugs are either enzymatically or chemically metabolized to an active parent compound. They enhance the drug bioavailability through the modification of hydrophilicity or lipophilicity. Examples, epinephrine, timolol, pilocarbon, gancyclovir and acyclovir. Cyclodextrins, they are uh, breakdown products of starch or cellulose. They are either synthetic or one minute. Yes ma'am. One, 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 one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> they are uh, either a synthetic or natural cyclodextins. So, natural cyclodextin has a disadvantage of limited aqueous solubility. Uh, hence, the hydroxyl groups are replaced by hydrophobic moieties, that is, methoxy. Uh, th this delivers the drug by diffusion method. So, iontophoresis is by electroporation technique in which electric field induced ocular tissue structure alteration and pore formation occurs and positively charged drugs are driven into the tissues at the anode or versa versa. Microneedle drug delivery, just a minute, uh, which is minimally invasive and so has a sustained drug delivery uh, and, and is available as a detachable hybrid pen with microneedles. Pumped up blood drug delivery. The controlled drug release is possible even up to 180 days and it is in uh, a practice for usage in dry eyes and glaucoma and cataract. Collagen shields, it's a well known uh, newer drug delivery system, contact lenses and sets. Future technologies are coming up with the smart nano micro platforms, extracellular vesicles and tissue engineering. Thank you for the kind attention. Thank you, Arinda. We took up the entire topic actually. We wanted you to focus on corneal drug delivery, the newer technique. So, which one do you think uh, is coming up for corneal drug delivery? Yeah, like, like, uh, like not for a micro my microbial keratitis. Cyclosporin uh, 0.09. Like the, the latest drug uh, they launched like cyclosporin 0.09% is being coming up with the nano uh, missile technology. So the, and the uh, intent was 
So you are in general most to talk yeah. about microbial like, catechism. Yeah. There so, are actually few, uh, uh, all those, uh, they are under uh, drug trials only, ma'am. They are not being used in uh, practice, uh, clinical practice as such. So, natamycin uh, and the gatifloxacin, all those drugs are being. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anita, for uh, covering such a tough topic, actually. Uh, we move on to the next. Uh, appreciation for putting together such a tough topic. Uh, the next speaker we again slightly changing the sequence. Apologize for that, but if uh, those who have a flight this evening, it takes a lot of time to get to the airport, and we've been advised to give a good time for that. So we have Dr. Nidhi Gupta, who is going to talk about the work and for the opportunity, and because my topic from was A to Z of chemical burns, I thought I'm going to only get in cases which I've managed from the first year of their presentation, so that after 10 years later, what is it that I have learned? At the end of it, I would only like to conclude with some take-home messages from these very examples. So when you see ocular surface burn, you see a variety of cases which vary in their etiology, in the day of their presentation, and also in the extent and depth of their injury. But when I see 10 years later, my practice, when I started treating chemical burns, and Shoff is at a place where you get a lot of acute burns, so you have an opportunity to learn and treat as well. I feel that it is the agent, it is the time interval between the injury of presentation and also the extent, not only the depth of the surface damage, the urinary and bilaterality of the, of the injury matters. And finally, what you can change is your management at every step whenever it presents. But the principle of management remains the same. At the acute stage, it should be a globe-saving surgery. At subacute stage, manage the inflammation. And at chronic stage only, you start for which will rehabilitation. So you have a tailor-make approach you have to take from the various permutations and combinations of procedures that can be done on this eye when it presents with a sequelae of ocular, surf of ocular surface burn. So starting from an example of a uninatural ocular surface burn, here is a 30-year-old patient who presents with 10 days of molten iron burn, which is actually a thermal burn, which is much deeper than a usual Chura burn injury. And at, or at presentation, what you would notice, and I've tried to put that red mark, because that is exa exactly what it is, perilimbal ischemia, which is missed and it is different from a simple surface inflammation, which you see otherwise. And what is going to help, apart from the amniotic membrane, is to do a tenon plastic, which is basically a procedure of getting vascularization to this perilimbal ischemia by pulling it all the way through from the from near the muscles, bringing it anteriorly and suturing it near the area of the ischemia. I would not go through for the whole of the slide of this uh, of tendon plasty, but that is how this patient healed for the next six months. And if you will see at the next three years of follow up, this very patient that presented had a visual equity of 612, and there was a lower simbriferon which was present. It doesn't require any management and some amount of scarring with which he was fine. We, we could have done a doubt, but he was very fine with it. So with 612 vision, with a simple procedure of tenon plasty and amniotic membrane transplant, you are able to heal a patient of great for injury. But sometimes, if you will actually trace the patients of perilimbal ischemia and they present late, then it can actually result in a melt like this. This is a last month's patient. We had a six weeks hot aluminum burn, and you would see the difference that the patients presented with a large desmetocele and a perilimbal ischemia. What we did, and this was possible in emergency management, was to do a dalk in this patient. We were able to salvage this eye with a dalk. and the end of it, we did an amniotic membrane grafting in this patient. I'll show you more patients wherein actually there was a perforation. But this patient in future is actually looking for a limbal stem cell transplantation and finally probably a repeat dalk for a good vision outcome. So we have printed our papers, uh, printed work on sclerosis ischemia. This was published in the Journal of Cornea, and this is different from Dr. Duval's work, which is the phenomenal work on chemical burn on the basis of which we treat most of the patients is that he did not define ischemia. What he said was limbal involvement. In our paper, we have defined what is perilimbal ischemia and what you should be doing. What we found in patients with perilimbal ischemia were two important things. That perilimbal ischemia, the more the, the more the clock hours of involvement increases and the depth increases, there are high chances of hypotony right in the acute stage. And if they present late, they'll present you with perforation. So managing perilimbal ischemia right in the beginning is very important in plastic. It also impacts in long term the outcomes of SLED. 
This is another patient which presented with tuna burnery, and I would just go through this patient that this is how, this was a more superficial burn, unlike the thermal burn, and this is how it resulted in total limbal stem cell deficiency. We all know the procedure of SLET. I'll not go through the slide of the SLET and the video, but it primarily gives very good results in patients with such kind of a presentation of total limbal stem cell deficiency. We Not only SLET does improve or reverses the LCD in these patients, it also improves the corneal clarity over time. And this has been the work by LVPI group. We also published our work along with the LVPI group and also with the other multicentric studies. And, and globally, it has shown that 70 to 80 percent of the patients with LSCD, with unilateral ocular burn in chemical injury, can show very good outcomes in, in, with simple SLET without doing any other secondary procedure. The only two prognostic factors which are important are the grade of the simpliferon as well as the need for a penetrating keratoplasty at the time of the acute burn. So if you do not require any of these two, if they are not there, then you would have very good outcomes in these patients and also pediatric age group does very well. Now this is a patient and I just want to show, go on to the factor of simpliferon, how it plays a role. You will see this is a patient of thermal burn and 50% of the limbus is spared. But look at the way the simlifron has progressed despite of us doing the tenenplasty and AMG in the acute stage. And the next procedure we did was fornix formation with a simple sled. And this patient required a penetrating keratoplasty and a sled again. So patients of simlifron, you're dealing with a much severe grade of a burn and you would require additional procedures. We did publish our work on, on the penetrating keratoplasty outcomes in patients of sled in Journal of Cornea, and we found that the results for the next one, one and a half year that we followed up. Now this patient is about four years. This picture is, a, is an old picture and he's doing well, very well. So we have patients about six, seven years of follow-up also post-slet who are very, doing very well with that graph. And that's an example of this child, eight-year-old Chuna Burn. This child at eight-year-old presented and we did uh, a, a number of procedures. We did formix formation, the SLED procedure, then followed by PK and ECCL. And now this child is 16 years old and he comes on his own and is a 624 vision maintaining for next eight years of follow-up. So pediatric age group, if you treat it early on time and timely basis management, they do extremely well. Now patients of bilateral ocular burn are totally a different ballgame because they are the patients in which you do not have the other eye for the limbus. And that's why our, I'll just take one minute more. So in these patients, if you are not able to treat with a BOSP lens, then this is a patient where we have done an allosled and immunosuppression is, is what you have to actually follow up along with these patients, but they do well. And this is one patient where there was a bilateral chemical burn with steroid ischemia and total corneal perforation. We, in emergency, did bilateral tenenplasty with therapeutic PK. We were able to salvage one of the globes after one year of follow-up and underwent a Boston keratoprosis. So in patients of bilateral ocular burn, this is one of the uh, modalities that you can use to rehabilitate, but we, we definitely over time have learned to do more allosled than Boston Capro uh, in these eyes. And just the last patient to tell you that you could actually would be requiring the need of an oculoplasty person if there is involvement of the lids. And they actually created the lid for this patient and then we went ahead and did a Boston Capro and this went well. So to conclude, I would just like to say with all the, all the experience of closely following up these patients for very long, Scleral ischemia, perilimbal ischemia, diagnosing and treating with tenenplasty in the acute stage is extremely important. There's no doubt that amniotic membrane transplantation above grade and four grade has a long-term impact on LSCD. It's not a published work, but it, the randomized control trial only talks of outcomes after the acute stage. But if I follow my patients of these on long-term, I found it has an impact even on the outcomes of SLED. So doing an AMG is very important. Simply for all management, stepwise would give you very good outcomes. SLED has extremely good outcomes in patients of unilateral ocular birth, 70 to 80 percent success rate. Combine it with a PK and a DAL if you have, uh, have a corneal scarring. And patients where you have bilateral LSCD, BOSP would be the first line of management and allocell would be my second choice. And kirato processes would be only my last resort. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and time. Uh, for a great, excellent talk. Uh, next, we move on to Dr. Anaita from uh, Edwin Prasada Institute, who's going to talk about allergy. And meanwhile, while she's setting up, any comments from Aditya about uh, chemical injuries? You must be seeing a fair share. Please speak up. Please speak up. So, allergy analysis. 
So, good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizing committee and Dr. Elsa for providing me the opportunity to present her today. So, I'll be talking about uh, management of refractory allergy diabetes. As we know, ocular allergy can present to us in different ways, and there are several therapeutic modalities available out there for the management of these patients. Despite this, even when we see a patient of ocular allergy, even though we know what the patient has and we know how to treat the patient, we still see a subset of patients who don't respond the way we want them to or they end up developing CKD. And an important reason for this is the fact that these patients are not correctly classified. So, uh, what happens because of this is that the patients are either under treated or over treated. For example, a patient who has an intermittent disease which is mild may get repeated portions of steroids and develop a complications because of the chronic steroid use. And on the other hand, a patient who has a chronic disease may not have or may not get adequate medical therapy and have a frequent relapses. So there are several classification systems uh, in literature which help us classify these patients and correctly categorizing them is very important. So over the course of my talk, I will be focusing on the chronic uh, form of uh, ocular allergy which is defined as allergy which relapses within a month of stopping medical therapy. So when a patient presents with an acute phase of allergy, the first line of treatment is topical steroids and based on whether the patient has a moderate or severe disease, we can give them a surface steroid like rotipredinol, etapamine or uh, severe steroids, in, uh, uh, potent steroids in severe disease with uh, prednisolone acetate. Usually a short course of 4 to 6 weeks is given to these patients. Other medications that are used during the acute phase include antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers. Now these are the most commonly used medications. Uh, the first two are mast cell stabilizers. They have a slower onset of action, uh, but the efficacy is there for a prolonged period. Levocapacitin is an antihistamine. These are very rapid, but they have a very short duration and the effect is over within 4 to 6 hours. And by and large, these medications are not used in uh, chronic ocular allergy. The next group of drugs, these are the dual acting drugs. They combine the effect of both antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers. But if you think about it, the immediacy of these medications comes from the antihistamine part, and that part is anyways covered by the topical corticosteroids. So once again, these medications are perhaps superfluous when uh, we see patients of chronic ocular allergy. And just mast cell stabilizers in isolation may suffice with the corticosteroids. Now, because the patients have chronic disease, they will require maintenance therapy and here topical calcineural inhibitors are the drugs of choice and uh, they also have a delayed onset of action. They start uh, somewhere between 6 to 8 weeks and so it is imperative to give the patients corticosteroids in the acute phase. The, the uh, effectiveness of these medications has been established in literature and head-on trials comparing cyclosporin and uh, dacrolimus have found that both have similar efficacy. But, Dacrolimus is an ointment, it has a once lifetime dosage and overall the discomfort with dacrolimus is lesser so it is easier to use this medication in children. This is a case example of a patient with uh, moderate uh, BKC with limbal variant and the patient was given topical steroids, mast cell stabilizers and dacrolimus and the patient had a very good response to the same and was kept on a maintenance dose of mast cell stabilizers and dacrolimus. Now why this particular combination of medication is preferred? To explain that, let me take you back to the pathogenesis of BKC. So as we know, BKC primarily begins when there is an exposure to an environmental pathogen and this initiates an IgE-mediated inflammation. And how BKC is different from the rest of the allergy is that this is not the only mechanism at play and there are several other pathways of which the cellular pathway is the most important one since it causes structural pre-mortality. So, the mast cell stabilizers act by suppressing the IgE-mediated uh, inflammation and calcineurin inhibitors directly inhibit the T-cell activity and so they act on this half of the inflammation and that is why together they are a very effective uh, combination for maintenance therapy in these patients. Now, counseling is a very integral part of management of patients with ocular allergy. It's both the patients and the parents must be explained about the chronic course of the disease. They, uh, we have to advocate against self-medication with steroids and of course avoiding IO. Now I will just discuss in brief about the sequelae of ocular allergy, the most common of which is shield ulcers. This again can have different grades of severity. The minor ones are treated with medical therapy, whereas the more severe ones require a with or without an amniotic membrane graft. 
Now, this was a patient who was managed with medical therapy and showed a very good response. She tells us typically occur secondary to giant papillary papillary virus and managing this is just as important. And the conventional uh, mode of therapy is with supratarsal steroids. But it is important to understand that when you give supratarsal steroids, the disease can recur within six months of the injection. So these patients have to be kept on very close follow-up. And if the patients have repeated attacks, it is a good idea to give these patients oral immunosuppression. Now this was again a patient who had received multiple injections from elsewhere and presented to us with exuberant giant papillary conjunctivitis. And with a course of oral steroids and cytosine, the patient had a very dramatic response to complete resolution of the papillary conjunctivitis. Now this In was the yeah. Sorry. Uh, other modalities include excision with the replacement of the penelia with either a pentagram or autograph from mucous membrane graft. Now coming to the uh, sequence of mucal variant, we have LACB. If the central island is clear, you can give the patient a sterile contact lens and if there is total LACB, I will stand in the treatment of choice. These patients do very well. Just here. And uh, keratoconus is yet another association. Here keratoconus progresses very quickly and they require splits and earlier. Cataract and glaucoma, these are things that often get mixed and we have to be on the watch for these uh, uh, entities as well. I'll just uh, move on. So, to summarize, it is uh, very uh, important to understand the classification. What is the type of disease that the patient is presenting with? Irrespective of the type, all patients require counseling. We have to advise against eye rubbings and avoidance measures. Using antihistamines in isolation or muscle stabilizers in isolation is not sufficient for moderate or the severe chronic ocular allergy. And these patients will require short courses of topical steroids during the acute phase. If it is not responding to this, topical calcineurin inhibitors and then subsequently oral and systemic calcineurin inhibitors can be added. And finally, in the last uh, cases, severe cases, patients will require surgery. And it is important to refer these cases to higher centers for the appropriate care. But I invite the next speaker, Dr. Swan, to uh, come and deliver his talk on dry eye. Uh, maybe a quick question or comment from uh, Sujata, Dr. Sujata Das regarding poor management of uh, chronic allergy, which does not respond to topical medications. <laughs> So I think that's the difference between the practice that the severity that we see and uh, quite, of, quite a few of us are now more uh, sort of onboarding with a short course of oral steroids and even using immunomodulators because these diseases go on for years. And so that was the reason for Anaita's talk to convince others that even this is one more instance where oral immunosuppression has a role to play. It may not be for such a long time, but for a short time. Thanks Anaita for covering the topic so well. For including me in this session. So I'll be talking about managing severe dry eye, a very tricky area, no financial interest. So the first uh, tricky part is there is no uniform definition as per the dues to classification. You can have severity based on clinical grading, imaging, investigations, questionnaires and also subjective grading. This is something from the Mexican group of dry eyes. So they have given it based on the symptoms, questionnaires, clinically what you're seeing on the breakup times, <laughs> staining, the Oxford's grading system, Sharmers, and also looking at the lids and the restoration of the ocular surface. This is something you can go by to determine what is severe. And the first thing begins with severe dry eyes, patient counseling and motivation. So these are patients who have already roamed around multiple doctors, switched multiple medications, and they want quick relief. So you have to explain the chronicity, explain the costs, explain control versus cure, motivate lifestyle changes, and in some extreme situations might warrant professional changes too. So just an outline of the management, it requires multimodal approach. So this is from a survey that was done in the US. So if you look at the severe dry eye, 
four to five and above grades of modalities. The last row, if you look, so in severe triad, more than fifty percent requires more than four or five different modalities going on to treat them. So there's different groups of pharmacotherapy, oral medications, procedures, devices, compounded medications, and finally surgical interventions. And this is again very familiar from the DUS2 classification. So here we are looking at the bottom part of the chart. So briefly speaking, you start with the lubricants. You have to start with something high lubricants. Start with something with high retention like uh, hyaluronate or HPQR. Osmoprotectants definitely have a role. We have now lipid containing drops in our country. Again, electrolyte containing drops are required to replenish whatever is lost. However, the ideal, ideal artificial tear drops to treat severe dry eye does not exist in market. So here is the role of topical immunosuppression. So mostly we usually start with the initial short course of steroids. However, in very severe situations, you might require them to be given over a prolonged period of time. All steroids have been studied and you can give them choose as per depending on the severity. Now comes the role of immunomodulation. Our previous speakers have covered it quite well. Cyclosporin A is the most commonly given eye drop in this category for severe dry eyes. We have given formulations like the cationic emulsions, so which are equally effective as the initial molecule. And there have been some studies which have experimented with three or four time dosing instead of the BD dosing. Tacrolimus can be given. The lipidic rust has shown good efficacy, but we are sort of on the debatable about the shelf life of the medication. Next, functional occlusion can be with the, done with the plugs, which can be either temporary or permanent. Or you can go ahead with the surgical approach by either a cautery, radio frequency knives, or even suturing the puncture shunt. Procedure based, the MDD treatment procedures are quite well established over the almost 10 years now. We have the thermal pulsation therapy and the intense pulse light also. Now that it has FDA approval, we can expect to see much more publications. There is this nasal stimulation device, you just put it in your nose, it delivers a short electric current and hopefully that uh, stimulates the lacrimal glands. And then there is definite role of scleral and specialty contact lenses. Autolover serum drops, they work amazingly well in severe dry due to the anti-inflammatory and epithelial growth properties. However, there are logistic limitations. So now what people are doing is they are uh, experimenting with direct autologous blood. So you ask the patient to do finger pricks four times a day and then they apply the same blood in the eyes. If you don't want to do that, there is the allogenic serum drops. This has been extensively studied in the GVD, chronic GVDH patients and also there is interest in the umbilical cord blood serum. However, no superiority studies have been established. Now we have this, this is a new hype, the platelet-rich plasma. You can make drops containing platelet-rich plasma or you can inject directly into the lacrimal glands which have shown promising results. I guess this would be the newer research which is yet to come. Surgical approach, tarsorephy, already Dr. Nerd has explained how tarsorephy helps. This is again a very promising thing which is slowly being, being uptaken. It's more in the domain of the oculoplasty surgeons, the salivary gland transplants and in cases severe uh, dry eye we can have sterile melts so this is urgent surgery in the form of either corneal patch, uh, UBCL, a quinone patch, maybe combined with tarsorephy and maybe even a keratoplasty in extreme situations. Amniotic membrane again if the surface is breaking down too frequently and too bad, <coughs> amniotic membrane definitely can rescue that. It has got anti-inflammatory and growth properties. And then these are the oral and non ocular medications. So oral secretogox, phylocarpine definitely has been studied. This is something available in the US. This again is a nasal spray which promotes the tearing secretions. And the neuropathic pain has been studied to have some role of vitamin B12. So you can probably try and test them and give oral parent parental supplementations. So when I was looking at the PubMed, so the first uh, publication on severe dry eye was back in 86. And there they were talking about applying vitamin A ointments. So word of caution here is because there are so many new uh, publications and new medicines try coming in. So you have to be really careful about choosing what you give to your patients. So this was the infamous uh, publication or the research by Dr. Shekhar Sen, which eventually led to some scandals in, at uh, Harvard and Maya Sayan here. 
So finally, the tricks to managing severe dry eye. So you should have a knowledge of the various pharmacotherapy modalities. Definitely, multimodal approach is needed here. So drops plus devices. Treat the underlying systemic cause, and you should time the surgical or any other procedure-based interventions correctly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for an excellent talk. And yes, you must bring frequently in the halls also. It will make us stay awake also. And I think you managed the topic very well in six Thank minutes. You, covered a lot. Uh, we'll go to the second last talk in this session by Dr. Sibi Chaudhary, and uh, she's a cornea specialist as well as contact lens specialist from Eddie Pesada Institute. So she's going to talk to us about contact lenses, how we can use it to maximize our cornea practice. And the last talk in this session will be by Dr. Raki, uh, who's here. Uh, following which, we will hand over to our own uh, friendly neighborhood next session people like Sponja from Sushpitari. So she won't mind if we go a little overboard. So uh, thank you, Dr. SS, for giving me the opportunity. Um, so I'll be talking about the contact lenses and its uses in cornea practice. So there are different types of contact lenses, which include soft contact lenses, corneal RGP lenses, and then the larger lenses, which include uh, corneoscleral, miniscleral, and scleral lenses. Uh, talking about soft lenses first, which we most commonly use as bandage contact lenses, and as we all know that uh, these uh, are helpful in pain relief, in promotion of epithelial healing, they provide mechanical protection, maintain hydration, and are commonly used for drug delivery method as well. Uh, if we are using these lenses uh, with a therapeutic goal of protection of the ocular surface and healing of the epithelium, then the lenses to be preferred are high decay silicon halogen lenses. If we are, uh, if the goal of uh, the use uh, is not only just ocular protection but also stromal wound healing, then we should consider low water content hydrophilic lenses as these tend to attract vascularization and can uh, arrest the ongoing ulcerative process of the stroma. If the eyes uh, are suffering from a dry uh, condition, then in that case, the lens preferred is a moderate water content silicon, hydro, uh, silicon hydrogen lenses, uh, as they not only uh, provide protection but also uh, contribute to the comfort uh, in these patients. So, this is a table that gives you a brief of all the majority of the lenses that are available in the Indian market, uh, and it includes both hydrogen and silicon hydrogen lenses. Something important to pay attention in this in this table is that majority of the hydrogen lenses or all the hydrogen lenses have a maximum decay value of up to 50 uh, decay, while uh, the silicon hydrogen lenses are the ones with the decay value, majority of them having above 100. So as a practitioner who uses BCL in the practice very commonly, should know what type of, what brand of lens that you're using and what is the material that your lens is made of. Because this can help you decide what should be the replacement schedule and the follow-up visit of the, that patient, uh, so that it does not harm the uh, corneal or the ocular surface. Uh, when you are putting the BCL or soft lenses, it is important that the lens is well centered, covering the cornea, thus providing ocular protection. There should not be any air bubble between the corneal surface and the lens, as it can lead to desiccation of the cornea. And the most important part is the adequate movement of that lens with every blink over the corneal surface as it ensures adequate tear exchange uh, between the two surfaces. Talking about, uh, talking about astigmatism, these lenses also help in correcting both regular and irregular astigmatism. Uh, there are soft lenses in the form of soft toric and soft lenses which can correct up to 15 diopters of cylindrical error. Uh, soft toric lenses are made of silicon hydrogel material and can correct up to 2 to 3 diopters of cylindrical power, while kerosoft lenses can correct up to 15 diopters but are made of hydrogel material and are yearly disposable. Uh, patients uh, who have the best quality visual acuity uh, correcting, get, correcting to 20 20 with glasses are the candidates for soft lenses, while those who uh, don't uh, achieve a vision of 2020 are candidates for irregular astigmat, uh, are candidates for corneal RGP lenses. These not only include those uh, uh, patients but also patients with ectatic conditions, uh, post corneal scars, or uh, post radial keratotomies as well as post PK. Uh, those patients who are not tolerant or poorly tolerant to corneal RGP lenses or the fitting is compromised unacceptable or the lens is unstable on the surface or in patients with advanced ectatic conditions are good candidates for scleral lenses. 
Uh, moving on to chemical injuries. In patients with uh, acute injuries like uh, uh, with, uh, with mild grade of chemical injury in the form of uh, epithelial defect, these patients, uh, we can use BCL in these patients very commonly. In patients with the chronic stage where the patients come with uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, these after limbal stem cell transplant do very well either with uh, scleral lenses or corneal RGP lenses. Also post surgical intervention either in the form of amniotic membrane grafting or limbal stem cell transplant in their early post-op recovery. Uh, again contact lenses are important for this brain. This is a paper that we recently published which uh, tells us about the safety and efficacy of different types of contact lenses particularly the RGP lenses. Uh, in patients with SLED, where uh, it has, we have uh, concluded that these lenses are safe, uh, can are safe for uh, such eyes and does not have any harmful effect on the liver implants. Um, talking about other ocular surface diseases, uh, scleral lenses play a very important role. Corneal RGP lenses have very limited use because of the uh, poor aqueous uh, condition or status in such eyes. So scleral lenses are the proper, uh, are the correct indications in such uh, uh, cases. Uh, they not only provide symptomatic relief in patients who are very extremely photophobic, but they also provide protection and visual rehabilitation to such uh, patients. So uh, this is one such case where the patient had severe, uh, uh, where the patient had very uh, poor ocular surface, a little related keratopathy and corneal scarring. After MMG and topical steroids and scleral lenses, patient did uh, well. This is one major review that we have published recently where we have described the use of contact lenses in dry eye disease and various ocular surface disorders. So, uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that all types of lenses are important in our cornea practice. We should know what type of lens to be used and when and when to call these patients for follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Siri. Uh, you covered the topic so well, and all of us we use bandage contact lenses. I think that is without it, I don't know what we would do. Uh, we move on to the last topic for this session, that is by Dr. Raki. And uh, for those of you, maybe we can have a quick comment from either Aditya or uh, Sujata about contact lenses, especially that. Do you have any practice where supposing you do a blue PCL that you remove the lens from the eye and replace it every month? I used to do that. I used to do the change very seriously, but everyone but I don't think there are a lot of for giving me this opportunity. So I'll be talking about management of OSSN in ophthalmic practice dealing with red. Uh, OSSN is a term that includes all kinds of neoplasia of ocular surface from dysplasia to carcinoma in C2 to FCC. Uh, it is not very rare uh, in our practice uh, as it is one of the most common uh, non-pigmented uh, tumor of the ocular surface. Uh, clinically, it presents as a uh, fleshy unilateral mass could be bilateral or uh, multifocal in some cases and its morphology ranges from uh, gelatinous to leukoplakic to papillomatous or nodular or nodular ulcerators. Uh, clinically uh, we can identify these uh, tumors very easily with the presence of feeder vessels, intrinsic vessels, uh, rose bengal stain is very useful in these cases, keratin plaques and scleral fixity is one of the very important tests which uh, we want to do in each case. So uh, diagnosis, yes, uh, surgical biopsy is one of the gold standard for diagnosing these cases but we are more intended towards uh, uh, the non-invasive modality like uh, ultra high resolution OCT or UBM to rule out any intraocular extension, impression cytology though it's not very confirmatory many times but yes and uh, CT scan only in doubtful cases where we suspect uh, any kind of orbital extension. So management uh, in terms of surgery versus topical, we always think of uh, these two when the patient comes. Uh, so wide surgical excision with cryotherapy or with or without adjunctive metabolite is a gold standard uh, treatment for these with lower recurrence rate. But if the positive uh, margin is positive, then the recurrence rate is very high. And it may lead to limbal stem cell deficiency, scarring or any kind of uh, you know, uh, stem reform formation. 
Uh, now the uh, there is a shift uh, towards uh, the non-invasive treatment. Uh, I mean, uh, non-interventional treatment like uh, topical uh, therapies. Uh, because they treat larger surface at one time and uh, it, it can be repeatable, it allows uh, higher concentration, we can uh, play with concentration also and it, it acts directly over the tumor and it avoids the stem cell deficiency. So when to give this topical therapies, we can uh, use it as a therapy, as a chemo or immunoreduction, as a, a preventive measurement and it can be used in any type of cases, dysplasia to SEC, uh, mainly in cases where patient is unfit for the surgery and if the tumor is involving pupillary axis or if the tumor is recurrent or multifocal. So what do we have in topical therapies? There are uh, topical mitomycin C, interferon 2B. Nowadays, people are using interferon 2A and topical 5FU. Other than that, there are a few case reports on anti of retinoic acid, topical cytopovir, uh, photodynamic therapy as well as aloe vera in cases of uh, tumors. So topical interferon NFO 2B is something which is very ocular friendly in these tumors and it has a very good success rate and its action is basically anti proliferative and immunomodulatory effect. But the downside of this drug is it needs refrigeration and it is of high cost and it requires long therapy. So this is a case of CC uh, proven on impression cytology and uh, the very good result we found with the interferon uh, alpha 2B and I have been following up this case for last 10 years and there is no recurrence found. This is another case of pigmented OSSM who responded very well to interferon 2B without any uh, you know toxicity. Leukoplakic uh, patients OSSM also respond to this therapy but in this case, uh, uh, we have just found a partial uh, response. So we published a case uh, in 2015, a Roger article, where we found that success rate of uh, interferon 2B in OSSN is 91.6% and the, they take a longer time to resolve the tumor that was around 3.5 months. Another therapy is topical mitomycin which is a very fast drug and we, were, uh, we are all aware of this drug with 90% success rate. Uh, its uh, action is very fast, it resolves the tumor, uh, we got uh, the median time around 1.5 months but it gives a lot, uh, lot of toxicity to the ocular surface uh, in terms of PED also. So we compared the drug uh, interferon alpha 2B and mitomycin and found uh, the success rate was similar in both the cases but it was definitely it was slightly better in MMC and the difference was in the time of resolution that was more in interferon. Uh, as far as adverse reactions are concerned then uh, uh, mitomycin in each patient actually uh, complained of something like toxicity or foreign body sensation and we had to add uh, low dose steroid in each and every case. Uh, while in interferon we didn't get much uh, complaints about uh, toxicity. Topical 5FU is one of the drugs which is uh, fast uh, with good success rate and cheap also. So this drug also gives a very good response in uh, OSSN cases, um, in all type of cases except uh, some nodular and nodular ulcerative. So what to assess during uh, topical therapy uh, when we give an OSSN, we have to check the response every time in terms of size, height and vascularization. We have to see whether the tumor has dissolved completely or not or we look at the uh, recurrence and the most important part is uh, the toxicity monitoring in terms of redness, foreign body sensation, epithelial defect or any kind of follicular reaction. So how I choose a treatment in uh, these cases, uh, according to Carol Karp, there is a size of tumor is one of the very important criteria if the tumor is less than 4 clark hours or uh, if the tumor is unifocal or of uncertain diagnosis, they prefer doing surgery and if the tumor is of more than 4 clock hours, multifocal or recurrent, they prefer doing uh, topical. But in my practice, I always give equal importance to morphology uh, apart from the size of tumor. If the tumor is flat, gelatinous or if the tumor is having more of corneal component, I would go for topical therapy first. And if the tumor has nodular, nodular ulcerative, irrespective of the size or if the tumor has tendency of orbital tumor extension, then go for the surgery 
or chemo reduction if the patient is unable to go for the surgery. Other factors which uh, keep in mind during topical therapy is the ocular surface. If the surface is dry, never start mitomycin C or a few. You can Did start interferon B. It's a last thing. And the cost definitely interferon is very costly drug and patient may have to spend around uh, 3500 or 4000 rupees in a month. Compliance is a very important factor if the patient is on topical therapy and follow up is also very important. So in conclusion, there are changing in uh, trends in OSS and management with no touch technique in surgery and non-invasive imaging and topical therapies. But we need to choose the most appropriate treatment regime to minimize the uh, toxicity as well as to improve the success rate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ducky, for uh, speaking on this topic. In just six minutes, you covered most of it. We are wanting you to. And with that, we conclude this part of the Konya subspecialty. There's one more last part coming up, don't we? And uh, just that because I'll be reading the mic, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers, uh, not only in this particular hour, but also in the coming, the next part as well as the previous part. I'm sure all of you have done fantastic jobs just like each of you has done in this session and I'm sure all of you must have grumbled to start with what is the six minutes, what is, what can we present in six minutes. Actually you can present a lot. You need to present something for I as an audience or a listener goes home with three messages. Let's say from Raki's talk, I know that as a cornea specialist I need to learn about OSS and I know that the topical therapy is useful now for these patients and I know that you have good success. So from each of the talks, if you can leave the audience with, with three messages to take home, that's value. And you don't have to have too many cases. You just have to have maybe 12 slides, but it can be very effective. So thanks for doing that. All of you have been extremely effective. And with that, I'll hand over to my friend, Dr. Anil Radhakrishnan, who's chairing the, the last session for today. And, and I thank uh, my patient co-chair and my chair for these sessions. And one more chair who disappeared. <laughs> and uh, some some people couldn't be here, the moderators, they had other commitments. So thank you once again. And with that, I'm leaving this session, but I don't want you to leave this session because this is all put up for, by, by it's like the government, right? By us, for us, and so on and so forth. So it's like that. Thank you very much.